All right. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we know that there's a lot happening on Zoom these days, so we appreciate very much getting to share this space with you and, and I'm very happy to know that you're here. Um, I'm Monica and um, I administer Wavemaker grants and other programs at Locust Projects. Uh, I hope most of you know us at Locust Projects already, but for those of you who may not yet, um, we are an arts incubator. We're actually Miami's uh, longest running nonprofit alternative art space. Um, our mission is to create opportunities for artists at all career stages, invite risk taking and experimentation, activate conversations around new art and ideas, which is what we're all uh, doing here together tonight, and advocate for artists and creative practices. Um, we're currently open by appointment only. You can make an appointment on our website, locustprojects.org. And of course, if you're not already following us um, at Locust Projects, please do so. That's a great way to keep up with all the fun things we're up to. Um, tonight, I'm very happy to introduce Paula Wilson, a multimedia artist based in New Mexico, whose exhibition On High is currently on view at Locust Projects until this Saturday, um, February 13th. So hopefully many of you have already gotten a chance to see that. Uh, if you haven't yet, um, please do make an appointment. You have until Saturday to check it out. Um, tonight, Paula's in conversation with New York-based artist Marin Hassinger, and our conversation will be moderated by Alpish Patel, Associate Professor of Contemporary Art and Theory at Florida International University right here in Miami. Um, while there won't be a formal Q&A tonight, we do encourage you to please keep the conversation going in the chat window. So if you have any thoughts or ideas, please feel free to drop them in there, um, and we'll be, we'll do our best to monitor that and include some of your uh, thoughts and questions throughout the program. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn the floor over to our moderator, um, Alpesh, and, and uh, you can get the conversation going for us. Thank you all again for being here. Thank you, Monica. And I think that you know we want to try to keep this introduction short so we can move to conversation. Uh, so maybe we'll go straight to Paula and she'll set the stage for the conversation that we hope to have on monuments. But again, just to reiterate, if you have thoughts or questions, um, you know, put them in the chat. I'd like to be able to uh, feed them to the panelists um, during the conversation instead of having a Q&A at the end of like five minutes, which sometimes isn't so great. So I'll give it over to Paula to, to start this presentation. Thank you, Alpesh. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and give a, 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 a short introduction here. Um, so it's, I just wanted to start with, um, with this picture because I've, I'm really excited to be showing alongside Meta Tomarov and Janine Antoni and uh, with in collaboration with Steven Petronio. I feel like these shows have a synergy that's palpable to me, even remotely in New Mexico. And I think that the shows really strengthen each other and I feel really supported by this kind of warm glow of, of, these, of these shows as well. So when you walk into my show at Locust Projects, you're greeted by this two channel video and on, and as well as this tunic painted and collage that's sort of spotlit in the room. So the left channel of the video shows the Confederate monument to General Beauregard that's being removed from its pedestal in New Orleans in May of 2017. And on the right channel is a covert performance four months later on the pedestal base. So how did I find myself here? I was fortunate to be an artist in residence with um, Marin and another group of really phenomenal artists at the Joan Mitchell Center in New Orleans. And 
The New Orleans, the Joan Mitchell Center is located here and that Confederate monument to Beauregard was located here. So if you're on your way to the New Orleans Museum of Art or to the city park, you'd be greeted by this monument kind of as an entryway into the promenade. And the, the artists and residents and I had really great conversations about, about the removal of Confederate monuments. Um, there was some conversation about what should be done with this, this pedestal base and whether or not this was kind of like a scar on the landscape or perhaps um, a marker for the scar of slavery. And to me, it raised a lot of questions, uh, questions about my artistic practice, like what kind of monument do I wanna see? Or what kind of monument would I want to build? And to what end and to what purpose? And I would pass this Confederate monument often when going to visit uh, this site, which is where these incredible live oaks are. Now this particular tree is between 750 and 900 years old. And you can see by that little guy standing over there, uh, our normal sized guy, but who is dwarfed in the shadow of this tree, the, the scale of, of this monument, I, I argue. And this is something that I really wanted to and did turn my attention to. Another place that I turned my attention to is the Backstreet Cultural Museum, which um, is, was founded by Sylvester Francis as a museum to the history of Blacks since the beginning of New Orleans. And within this museum is housed these incredible Mardi Gras suits that are entirely hand sewn that beadwork is all done by hand. And this is another example of something to me that is, is monumental. And these are crafted to be worn one day at Mardi Gras and uh, done in secret and kind of unveiled in, in, all its, in all its glory. This museum also had a lot of memorabilia and documentation of social aid and pleasure clubs in the city. Now, these clubs were provided, were created to provide social aid and, and pleasure to the black community that was underserved uh, to say the least. And most importantly, they provided burial services to the community. So these burial services kind of got integrated with sort of masquerade traditions from West Africa to become what we know now as jazz funerals or second lines. And so you would have a float at the beginning of the parade that was in honor of everyone who had passed who was a member of that club that year. And then the rest of the second line was all of us, you know, behind the band um, joining in. And this experience, if I could go back and like relive any experience, um, besides my first date with my partner, Mike Lag, I think this would be very high up in, in my list. And let me just give you a little bit of a taste of the vibe. <laughs> dancing. Everyone is dancing and people are um, giving up cupcakes and we also, uh, this is my friend Rhonda who brought me there and we, we bought these beautiful beads and this experience was profoundly life affirming to me and it provided me with a kind of ancestral restoration and gave me this awareness of like black joy that can integrate struggle and integrate death into, into its, 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 its power, its, um, its very existence. Like it can embrace that transitory nature of life. So here we are back in the studio 
And I'm going to play the video for you now. It's, um, it's one minute, but before I do, it's important for me to acknowledge that Marin was there with me. And there, I can't tell you, Marin, how much it meant for me that you woke up at whatever ungodly hour it was to, to support me in the creation of, of this work. And I, I felt as a result of your presence there that I was part of a larger continuum of artists and makers and thinkers and troublemakers. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let's watch this one minute video. <laughs> Thank you to Vashni and Jamal for the incredible soundtrack, speaking in your native tongue. So here's the site today, thanks to Google Maps. Um, and while I think that these hedges and plants are, you know, lovely, uh, they do nothing for the living and they do nothing to truth telling. Uh, they do nothing to start to, sh to spark debate, nor do they do anything to bring about collaboration. And I think that it's really important as, as we all struggle what to, what to do with these monuments um, to acknowledge that there's a way in which they help us see our true self. And Lastly, I just want to share some other work with you. This is uh, an installation at Smack Mellon in Brooklyn titled Spread Wild, Pleasures of the Yucca. And these monumental figures are in service to something that is, off, is tiny and often overlooked, which is this beautiful mutual relationship between the yucca plant and its sole pollinator, the yucca moth. And so I created these embodied, larger than life figures to kind of tell this story of the plant and these various stages of the, of the development of the plant and the moth. So this is the flower stage. And to me, this was, to me, this tells a story that is one that I want to model myself off of. I was installing this work during the Kavanaugh hearings and there's this profound sense that we need better models for how to craft relationships and that the, the relationship between the moth and the plant was one that sounded kind of romantic to me and, and even sexual. And so I you know, really wanted to kind of highlight this unseen um, relationship out in the land in New Mexico. And then this is uh, the backwards glance at the Bemis Center. And this was imagining a monument, a caryatid, that was, was taken by Lord Elgin in the 1800s and is now housed in the British Museum. And it's a controversial uh, thing because Greece wants, wants this statue back. And so I imagined that this statue kind of came to life and was able to escape the confines of the museum and reveal itself in all of its kind of um, uncubed servitude. And you know, these sculptures were, were painted at the time. 
And so, and also that they had a real multicultural existence to me. I mean, if you look at the hair, it's a total fro. And so I think that they've been, you know, very systematically whitewashed. So I wanted to bring that color and that power back. And then another instance in which I'm sort of embodying the monument is in my video, Salty and Fresh, which was shot at Virginia Key in Miami. And here I am kind of, you can, you can view the video on my website, but here there's this desire to, you know, kind of place myself within an art historical trajectory and, and claim a mantle of, of power and, and presence that might have been denied people of color in the past. And so with that kind of kick off a little bit of a, um, an array of work, I'm gonna pass the mic on to Alpesh to, to talk a little bit about Castle's monument push. So this was a, a public artwork actually uh, took place at Bemis. Uh, we saw some images of Paula's exhibition there. This work by Castle's uh, is called the resilience of the 20%. Uh, and it is titled after a very really sickening statistic, which is that in 2012, um, the number of murdered trans people in the world went up by 20%. So this is the resilience of that 20%. And the object that you're looking at is actually a cast of um, the endpoint of another work of Kat is called Becoming of an Image, um, this 2,000 pound mass of clay that she pummels actually. So she's cast that here. Um, and this work involves you know, taking this object um, throughout the city of Omaha to various sites of interest from where the first Pride Parade was in Omaha to um, the largest prison in the United States. Um, so th this was a fantastic I think, guest monument that uh, you know, deals with those voices that are never seen or can't be seen. Like, how do you begin to um, uh, acknowledge and address that? Uh, and this was really a fantastic way of, of beginning to think about collaboration from a different point of view, uh, which is that it took many people to move this around um, Omaha. It's, it was heavy. I was one of those people pushing and I fell as well <laughs> when I was doing this. Oh uh, so it was uh, super heavy. And you know, that was part of, the, I think, the, the experience for me was uh, feeling that weight um, of two tons, the mm. graph, the metaphor for um, uh, trans subjectivity. And, and you know, I think the question I have actually that's connected to Castle's work and what you showed Paula is, is this idea of space. And one of the things that I most enjoyed about your work when I first saw it at Bemis was that, you know, I'm not, I, I never see a, um, a woman of color take up that kind of space in a museum. Like it's always the white male that you see taking up space. But I'm curious if you could talk about, you know, how you take up space. I don't think it's the same way um, as uh, the white males that I'm sort of uh, uh, discussing. It has a much um, a different sort of approach that then actually connects to Maren's work as, as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So yeah, I'd love to engage in that and um, we can cycle there with, after Maren kind of goes over, um, Maren kind of goes over her, her incredible project monuments um, okay, I'm I'm happy to do that. I um, I really am so interested in what both of you are doing, and I've done this, so why why do I need to talk about it? You know, but um, I guess uh, I first started thinking I would do another another piece, and then I found I couldn't do that. I wanted to take photographs of everybody in the, who, you know, used the park and I wanted to make banners out of them, photographic banners. And I wanted those banners to hang high and go through each path throughout the park. And then I told it, told that to someone. And, and he said, photographs, oh no, 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 no photographs. And then I discovered that he was one of many drug dealers in the park who did not want to be photographed. And of course, none of their dealings, he didn't want those photographed. So I said, okay, I can't do that. 
so I started walking around again and this is something that I often do. Um, I just really think about spatially what what's there and you know, if there are people there, what people are doing there other than drugs. Um, and I just wanted a pleasant place for people to rest their eyes. Um, this is, these are, there were several of these monuments that circled the park and they imitated the site that they were placed in, like with this checkerboard site, there was a checkerboard cube next to it. And this is a very popular site. A lot of chess gets played and um, there are tournaments and everything. The, um, this was a small hill made from, you know, the rock face that's kind of pushing through the grass. So it was called Little Hill. And um, in the be and this was a triangular sort of area and the squirrels liked playing in this, jumping in and out of it. Um, and this was in a corner and there were two corner pieces. One was lower to the ground and kind of um, traced the uh, topography of the ground. And this one is like a finger pointing towards where the corner is. And um, this one, uh, is the same piece, uh, different, different location and a different bunch of branches collected by a different bunch of people, but still the corner. And um, it's in Washington DC on DuPont Circle um, by, the, by where the traffic goes through across from the park. Um, and this is the way it looked in the snow. It looks very nice in the snow. Good for it. <laughs> A lot better than I look when I go out in the snow. Um, yeah. Yeah. So anyhow, as far as like defining um, what th that particular series of monuments ended up being is it the land, the landscape the existing landscape was the thing that told me what to do. I didn't invent the landscape, it was already there. And I wanted my piece to communicate with the landscape in a quiet way. I didn't want it to really stand out. I wanted it to just be, you know, part of the landscape. And, uh, and so that's what it came out being. And, it also carried a message, I think, because there was a lot of collaboration involved. There were many, many people. It was sponsored by the Studio Museum in Harlem. There were many um, people who came to classes there and uh, various students um, sponsored by the museum. And I really liked the idea that people could work together without having to have all these specialized skills but having the feeling of the community and doing something to enhance the community and being part of that community, therefore. And, and to do it with something that could possibly be, I don't know, uplifting or something you could think about if you were having a quiet moment sitting on the bench in the park. Not, you know, a vacation from the hostility of New York you know, just a calm moment. And by making it materials that are related to the earth itself and the struggles that the earth is having with all of our incursions into it, with all of our stuff, our chemicals and progress and everything, um, it was, it, it, they became monumental because they expressed, I thought they expressed that idea. But something as simple as a branch, you can make something beautiful that can be, you know, calming, um, nurturing, supportive, and remind you that we're all here as a result of nature. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I, I feel that the, this question of taking up space, uh, it reminds me of like the very young, young Paula artist right out of undergrad who was sort of like, how do I get my art out into the world? And, you know, how, how there was no access to showing in galleries or anything like that. So I did a public art projects, you know, pasting posters like up, up on in the streets and these large illuminated signs, you know, and hung them, hung them outside these abandoned um, buildings where these businesses let me plug into. And so I feel like throughout my career, I'm often like just trying to like insert myself into the trajectory of art history or just into, into the, the landscape or into the, you know, into our environments and not kind of waiting for that to be done done for me or like in a sanctioned kind of way. Um, yeah. Well I guess I just try to always fit in. I don't wanna I don't wanna I want you to still know where you are and and this is just some kind of adjunct to it, you know. So even when I was thinking about doing the drug addict, or the you know, even though I was you know I was trying to think about the people who use the park, and I I still would have loved to have done that, except that people thought they would be arrested. So then I couldn't do that. I mean, I didn't want it to be negative. So Michelle Solomon has a really um, great question, I believe, and if I'm getting this wrong, please let me know. But um, you've written, I have an interest in hearing from the artists about the relationship of the monument. Monument is a monumental word. And, um, you know, I think a part of um, my, my connection to this comment is to this idea, you guys are redefining the terms of monumentality. So it is about ephemerality, uh, about relationship to the earth, um, about collaboration, these things that we don't normally think of when, when you think of a the typical Euro-American white male monument, but those things don't come to mind. You, you think of singularity, uh, you think of uh, a, a type of space that takes away the earth without necessarily giving anything anything back. I'm curious if you guys could talk a bit more about that. Um, thank you, Michelle, for that question. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the monumentality is, or the thing that is exciting to me to build a monument to is the kind of transitory nature of life, which is why it was so exciting to me to be a part of the second line, to see that celebration and death, you know, kind of co-mingling co so, um, so unabashedly. And so as an artist, it's kind of like, well, how do you, build a monument to something that's transitory in a way. And so, and I want kind of the monument to be a living thing. I mean, even these extremely large monumental paintings, in order to take them in, it's sort of a, a process of time. You know, like there's, there's all these stories embedded within them that, that get released through the looking, through the living, through the experience of the monumental. We can kind of come into relationship to our own bodies and our own temporality. Well, I think we're living in a really different time now. I mean, we're not living in the time when they made those Confederate monuments and thought they would last forever. We know now that things are just not gonna last forever. So why deal with that as a concept? Deal with something else, deal with something that's right here and right now. And um, for me, that's nature and people's interactions. So that's it. And the thing is, there's so much, um, well, if you trace like African performance and African um, sculptures, um, that that whole performative aspect uh, you, runs like a theme through everything, and you're picking up on that theme, and and trying to get these performative, special performative moments to be a part of your own work. 
And um, I think you'll be really successful because you were so excited about being in the ones in New Orleans. Maybe you have to go back to New Orleans and, and do it a few more times. And then, and then, wow, when you come back and you release it on everybody, I mean, you know, there will be all kinds of different kind of things at those shows and those museums. Mm. It's so beautiful that you zero in on that, Marin, because, you know, I, when I was 18, I went to Nigeria and uh, had an experience in with a masquerade uh, that really reoriented how I think about art. I mean, here, this was this, this mask that was kept in secret and then and brought out in this particular uh, masquerade uh, event was where the, the 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 spirit was running around with a whip whipping people and I and prior to it I was like oh that's cool it's going to be some dude in a in a mask and a headdress but then when I actually experienced this I mean it was terrifying to me I mean and. I saw that this spirit seemed completely like otherworldly. It did not seem like a person in, in a headdress. And then this experience got really zeroed in uh, when I went back to the US and went into the museums and saw this headdresses like this. Actually, my, my partner Mike made these earrings. And, oh. <laughs> and, it was so depressing to see this headdress under glass, uh, you know, with hot lights on it. It's supposed to be kept in secret. These are sacred objects and, and it has a light force to it. And so that, that kind of juxtaposed experience, I think has, has carried through my desire in art making, you know, to this, to this day. Right. Well, I think, uh, you know, maybe it's something genetic, but uh, you should keep it up. And it's, it's, it's that the Western idea about art that we see in all the museums we go to, this division of, of uh, you know, techniques, like, okay, here's the painting room, here's the pottery room, here's the sculpture room. Everything is based on the figurative, you know, locked into place. Everything is based on this incredible ability to reproduce the human flesh and bone and, you know, like a Michelangelo. So I, you know, it's just, it's just an entirely different way of thinking about the world. I mean, when in, as Westerners, we think of a, a singular God in heaven if we were Africans, there would be many gods. They would be walking amongst us. I mean, it's, it's just a whole, the whole thing is just different. So I think that some of those things we just have still within us from our, our ancestors and, and some of the things, uh, or we just function on intuition, but Mm -hmm. It's important to, as an artist, to let the intuitive parts shine forth, you know? I'm so glad you brought up these uh, other genealogies uh, the, right. uh, of, of looking again um, at, at the idea of the monument, which, um, you know, historically and transregionally is, is not the same. It's not a constant. Um, so uh, that, I think, is something that unfortunately doesn't get um, called into these conversations enough. Your works are bringing them out though. They're making it more palpable. Um, I feel like with, with, with Marin, your, your works are so elegant. You know, you talk about a corner and the corners are things that people avoid or-, or they, Oh yeah, that's true, yeah. And, and you're, it, there's this love that you throw onto, the, onto, onto this corner, uh, which is just um, absolutely amazing, but it, it, it does kind of um, uh, take us to a new way new way of orienting to the world around us, which is uh, very anti-Western, <laughs> the subject object divide, which is you know, very much um, uh, going back to the 1700s with Rene Descartes. I mean, you know, just it, it goes back, it's, it's here in the West for so long 
the sense of the, the of the difference between a subject and object and and Marin, like your work you know your work is both of those things it's a it's a subject and object at the same time it's a subject in making it feels like well that is just very very nice to say um maybe you should write a book <laughs> about it <laughs> We should all collaborate on something, <laughs> all right. Oh, goody, that's gonna happen and this is gonna happen, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, yeah, go ahead. Well, I had a lot of uh, rejection when I was younger. I'm glad I lived this long because I lived enough to see that there were at least a few people who were gonna support me, you know? Uh, and that I do have an opportunity to have a voice, like the voice that you're allowing me to have now, you know, because for so long, you know, everything is like a s total struggle. Um, I, uh, I also do very literal things, like I'm not really a figurative artist when it comes to object making, but I always figured my fig figurative art would be my performances. And, um, and I still feel that way about it. Like I, I don't think I can build anything figurative, but if a bunch of people are in a room, we can, be, we can start doing something, you know? Um, yeah, and I feel like there's, set, there's something that I love about your practice that way and that it, it, it does feel so collaborative, but not in the way that we maybe think about collaboration where you have like these two artists are collaborating on this one piece that they're producing in the world, but it's more of a nod to like, it's all collaboration, you know? I mean, we we're here together, we're, we're working on something that we don't, we don't know that comment that you made, how that affected another artist and, and, and was built into their work. Elizabeth here, um, so she writes, uh, uh, Marin is talking about a focus on the individual and objects that may ossify as values change. There's a turning over. I want to hear more of how you envision the future, the role of the object in the future. Hmm. Well, I'm not a seer. <laughs> um, the role of the object in the future, something for contemplation. What is this? What does it mean? Why is it here? What is this placement? Yeah. I like this idea of being able to know the answer to the question now. Um, uh, that maybe it requires a little bit more reflection and time to begin to answer such a profound questions. But these are big questions that are being asked. Um, Mike Legg is asking, you know, this doesn't the notion of death give life more meaning? Uh, he is asking these very metaphysical, um, big questions um, that Polly brought up this idea of death in Black joy and part of life. And could you talk a little bit more about that, I think, in, in relation to that particular question? Yeah, I think, and I think it actually relates to the question directed at Marin too, of like, what's the future of the of the kind of art object? I mean, I have like a, a piece of clothing hanging here, you know, and I, I do feel like the my desire is to to merge art and life and not to privilege the kind of gallery context or the museum context as the place, as the nexus for where art exists. And that feels more in line with a kind of embrace of death in a way, because like clothes get dirty and they're not going to, you know, they're not gonna last forever in their hermetically sealed, perfectly archival existence. And that, that these things that change of objects is a part of that, you know, and my work if it, if it leaves my, my possession is the only time when it will stop kind of being in motion. You know, I, I continually go back and work on things and have and want things to be embedded with that kind of, that kind of life force. Yeah, I was just thinking that um, it's hard to talk about the future, but it's actually possible to really be invested in the present and to make sure that the things that you're 
you know, concerned with and making and, um, and, and things that you're just thinking about on a daily basis are absolutely rooted in the moment. And if for some reason they last, well then, you know, then people will be able to say, oh, that's what that was like. I don't think it's impossible for things not to change, but I, I could never predict how they are to change. I, I love talk that. About like, oh God, I have to get up again, <laughs> you know, and put my shoes on and go out and everybody's screaming outside. You know, I, that's the only thing I can do. I love that answer. I think that that is extremely wise. And I think that our viewing can help elicit that kind of reaction, right? Like, or that's what I hope of my art is that in the viewing, you you are there, you know, you're, you're aware. And sometimes my art is even about the act of looking so that it has this kind of feedback loop that brings us back into the moment. And I do think there's something, um, you know, different about making figurative art and making non-figurative art. And maybe yeah. even what we mean by figurative. Uh, uh, or abstract, which, you know, those terms get thrown around as binaries too. Um, mm -hmm. the, figur the figurative is the opposite of abstract when um, abstraction itself is, is figuration, uh, but in a different form. I mean, I, I think you know, your work kind of begins to, to, to tap into some of those ideas there. Um, well, I think though that what I mean by that is um, if a person is, if an artist is compelled to do work that has figures in it, in it, that compulsion means something and that making of that figure is all wrapped up in that compulsion. Now, I may not personally have that compulsion, but somebody will and somebody will do that. The only thing is everybody who's making things, whatever those things are, they have to try not to be you know, falling into past habits or doing things. Like when I first got out of school, I was doing things because they were taught me. But after a while, you have to like grow up and get over that, you know? And so it doesn't matter whether it's figurative or non-objective or if it's a performance or a film, it just has to be, you know, honestly what you think and feel and wanna do, you know? And if you could, and it's pretty great if, if you can manage to have a career at some point where you're actually doing what you want to do in a place that you want to do it in and somebody is going to support it, whether they give you the space or they give you the cash, that's amazing. That is an amazing thing. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, let's not forget. <laughs> right. Let's st let's stick it out till we get so then we can have some power because it means that we will be given more and more space to put more and more honest things in, you know, things that that could really help out in the future somehow. You know. Well, at least it would be an honest evaluation of the past. You know. I wanted to just ask a question that's kind of um, outside some of these points for just a second about the art world. Um, uh, you know, I would say that both of you have had a measure of success in, in this art world that we're talking about is very problematic. And uh, I'm, I'm interested in you talking about how you've navigated through that system. Um, here you are, you're, you're, you're doing amazing work, we're seeing it. I think there are a lot of people that would want to hear about um, your experiences because we don't hear about those experiences enough from women of color especially yeah i mean i i feel like i i fled i fled new york to uh to carrizozo new mexico which is which is where i live and i it felt like the only way to silence those those voices um that were were not kind of in, in alignment with what I wanted to be thinking about or, um, or as Marion says, this kind of 
to make the work, to be at a point where we're making the work that we really want to make. Um, and, you know, and then, and then I felt like once, once I had left that, that city center, I had more of an, I was able to return with a sense of appreciation. And, you know, every time now I go see shows, I'm like, these are amazing. You know, whereas when I lived in New York, I was like, God, I can't believe they're showing that. Or I, why is this and that? It was like, um, I, I feel such an intense sense of, of gratitude now that, that, that I didn't before. Um, but there were moments after moving to Carrizozo where I was like, I made a giant mistake and I'm not, not you know, on anyone's radar. And I know Marin, you were in Baltimore for a long time and really felt like the move to living in New York is, has been an important part in people paying more attention to, to you and your work. Yeah, it changed everything. I wanted to live in New York from the time I got out of school graduate school in 1973. And I think I moved here, you know, like five years ago or something, four years ago. So, I mean, you know, but it made all the difference so that now, uh, you know, I can sell work. I, I mean, it's amazing that I can sell work. To me, that's amazing, you know? Right, it's again, I, that gratitude, right? You know, it's like, yeah. I, I think that there's, I'm really excited about bringing people to Carrizozo and having that be a site where the art exists, like where it's made is actually the best place for it to be viewed. And, you know, with COVID and all of these virtual meetings, it, it, it feels like a real opening, like a portal that we can walk through mm -hmm. and, and not expect everything to be served up in the same fashion, and you know, like augmented reality and, um, being able to sort of have persistent realities existing simultaneously, I think is, is super exciting. It is, it really is. And it's a real difference from when I was first starting out. I think you can't, you, you're proving that you can live out of New York and still manage. And I'm gonna say that what's also, what's really important and, and Marin just displayed what exactly you need to do with this is that you have to develop relations with writers, art people that write about art that were sometimes sometimes seen as being external, but those relationships, Castles, for instance, approach me to engage with their work. And uh, that has led to writing about it. So, I, I mean, just to kind of point that out there for anyone listening that develop those relationships uh, with writers, there's uh, even more allies maybe than you think um, wow, right? Rather than like, these are the critics who are going to be, you know, judging from a, a high, this is actually another, another artist to, right. to exactly. yeah. This is somebody else whose uh, passions run concurrently with your own. They just happen to be writing instead of, you know, knocking a wall down or something. <laughs> which is, <laughs> I think that's really wise. <laughs> uh, it makes a lot more sense. Uh, this is uh, Michelle Solomon says, I'm actually an arts writer. So she's outing herself as an arts writer. <laughs> <laughs> right. And Antibiria, writers are such a blessing to visual artists and vice versa. Uh, there's a lot of questions here. I'm just gonna pull out one here. Um, this is from Sandra Ramos. Um, hi, great panel, thanks so much. Um, I would like you to comment a little bit on the difference between monuments and public art um, and if it's still necessary to continue building monuments and uh, to what or to, to who. Uh, the public art monuments question is a really interesting one to tease out a bit. Like, well, you yeah. can redefine it like I did. I s called them monuments and they were just piled up twigs. They're public art, yeah, yeah. And then we were also teasing out like the difference between a memorial, like the Vietnam Memorial and a monument. I mean, I, you know, my, my friend uh, Damon Locks has this, uh, his band is called Black Monument Ensemble. And one of the, the lyrics is nothing ever changed by monument, you know? And I really, I kind of align myself with, with that sort of orientation. I think that monuments are built to, 
to entrench the powers that be. I feel like it's a it's a complete monuments tend to be about about power and maintaining maintaining that. Maybe I'm caught up in the in the Confederate monument um, debate, but I feel that public art is much more about um, reflection and art just existing in public. Mm -hmm. I think um, I think that's now the way it is being considered, because if you think about the 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 monuments uh, dedicated in Washington D.C. to the Vietnam War, the we were talking about this before. I think the 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 Mayo Lin piece is considered a memorial, not a monument, and the figurative work with the soldiers, uh, you know, fighting, uh, is considered a monument. I think of all the public work that I've ever seen that's dedicated to a, a, something like a war, the the um, Maya Lin's piece is the most brilliant thing imaginable. Just it's every time I think about it, I almost start, start to cry. I mean, it's just amazing. Everybody represented who lost their life and look at this, don't do this again. You know, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. But then again, if there were more people doing that kind of memorializing, if there were more, you know, forward looking people doing that, if they were accepted to be doing that and could do that, um, it would be better for the culture. The culture has moved towards Maya Lin, not towards you know, somebody with a gun fighting. Um, Bronze, yeah. Yeah, right. No, we're all moving her direction. So, um, you know, it, public art is possible to be very, very, very powerful. And uh, we have to open the door to it. You know, that's all. It's just the Mylin example is a, a great one because the two figurative sculptures that were made you know, no one remembers them. No one really knows. Yeah, they're really, uh, they're pathetic. <laughs> they're, they go back to our older ways of looking and, mm. and Maya's work is about engaging um, you. Oh. Well, but I do think it's, I mean, within that debate that the reason that those bronze sculptures are there is, is, is in part because people clamored for them or like at least, you know, that there was, the organizations that they're representing, you know, wanted that. And so there is a lot of work, I think, for artists to, to engage at, in, at every level of, uh, in these processes of what, what do people want and to allow that conversation to be more fluid and not just like, let's just have another emboldened thing that is what I thought it should be, if that makes sense. Yeah, the conversation should definitely open. This is a great question from Dylan um, Lilla. Uh, all these monuments performances are temporary, but you continue to exist in the digital space. How do you feel the quickness of your works versus the time of the normal monument? What do you think about these monuments continuing to exist in digital space? I think that last one is an inter interesting one. Like um, uh, these works in digital space, even as you presented them here uh, to us, what's your relationship to that? particular um, object, uh, digital object. Yeah. I like filmmaking. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Yeah, I mean, I do, I do too, as a, like the collaborative nature of it, especially. Um, and I love the way the editing process is kind of like collage. I mean, I, I think that what I love about the digital is, is the reach, um, you know, just to, for it to be able to be on someone's screen, you know, like walking down the street, I think is is super exciting. And I want art to exist in as many platforms as possible, and to um, to have that that accessibility. I feel. Uh, I think in terms of like the quickness, uh, I, I I think that we do have a an unfortunately shrinking time span, you know, that like attention span and I see it in myself um, and that 
in a way, I, I was happy to to make this video just one minute so that it, it could it could hold it could hold that space that we're that we're willing to to give it in this in this moment. I think well, I, I don't exactly understand that question. Uh, it, which part of it the well, like uh what kind of digital is he talking about exactly well, i think the idea is you know these works can exist in perpetuity online what's your relationship to that um object online do you feel i would imagine the question is and do you feel that that uh is problematic or not and before you answer this i was going to say one thing is we also fetishize the, the real this idea that is unmediated and it is just as mediated as any virtual experience. So there's, lay, you know, the, it's it's not a either or situation as well. Um, so that's the thing, like, you know, these, these uh, images that are online, um, uh, do you even think about them? Maybe they're not something that you could have thought of or-, or, or Yeah, feel. I mean, I, I do think about ways to integrate them in the future. Like I was saying about how I, I'm constantly remixing my own artwork and, you know, it never feels like it's finished. You know, I could see ways in which a video becomes contextualized, like I've embedded videos into paintings or, you know, if it does start to feel like this thing is becoming stagnant or monumentalized in a way that feels uh, like it's atrophied, I feel like there's there's ways to pull that out again to tease that that kind of um, never ending story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're we're actually um, at four minutes to eight, so um, and there's still a, a lot of fantastic conversation happening in, in the chat, uh, which is I don't want all of us to think of this as an ending, right? This is just uh, the beginning of hopefully more conversations. But uh, Paul and Maren, anything, any last words or anything you wanted to say before we, we wrap up here? Um, don't stop. Keep on keeping on. No, <laughs> it's just, uh, I, I just really, it's, you know, it's been a while, Maren, since we, we spent time together. You know, um, I think my show in New York was the last time we saw each other a couple years ago. And I just love, I love you. I love like the, the, the frankness, the, this sort of open heartness that you have in, in your work as well. The, you know, even some of the more recent pieces, they, I'm, I'm just so drawn to how, how you bring people together and how you bring us into, into the moment. And I'm so happy that- You know, thank you. That is a really, really sweet thing to say. And do you know that I'm unaware of that entirely, but I think you're probably right. And you know why? Because I taught for 20 years. <laughs> All you have to do is teach for 20 years and everything is possible. <laughs> so, um, oh man, I better get started. It's it's one way of communicating your ideas, you know. And it is better, I think, to teach than to be a waitress. You make hmm. more money. I don't know. I made the most money I ever made was when I waited tables. <laughs> really? Well, you could make more teaching. I can tell. <laughs> Because I waited tables too, and I made more money teaching. I just want to thank our, our audience for these great questions and for being engaged and being here tonight. And uh, Paula and Marion, you're brilliant artists. Thank you for being so generous and, and uh, talking with us tonight about your work. Alpesh, it's such a pleasure to be with you. And yes, thank you everybody for giving us an hour of your time. Yes, yeah, I pleasure. and I meant it when I said, write about it. <laughs> Get inside. I told you, Jane, that's why I brought it up to everyone. I was like, that's what you got to do. You got to ask. <laughs> and, uh, um, so I'll be emailing you about that. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank you all, Echo, all the thanks and gratitudes on uh, behalf of Locust Projects as well. Thank you for sharing. Um, insight not just into your work but from your lives and your personal experiences it, it felt like we really got to know um, each of you a little bit better and um, that's really special I think um, and Alpish thank you so much for your insight and 
and helping to steer the conversation and engaging our audience. And, and yeah, there were some really great questions and, and um, ideas floating through the chat. So uh, again, uh, if you haven't already seen Paula's show at Locust Projects, it's up until Saturday. Um, you can make an appointment. Um, we'd really love to see you, see you there and, and um, hope you get a chance to experience it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Good, Good luck, Paula. Thank you, man. <laughs>